Happy Friday. My name is Melissa McKay. I'm with the University of Calgary. I'm here as a volunteer to introduce this session. Um, we are at a fireside chat, Lessons on Leadership with Dan Peterson and Mike Cano. I have to say, Dan arrived. I'm very intrigued because it was like a rock star watching him move across the room as everyone was popping up from each table to shake his hand. And Mike looked at me and goes, yeah, he's very popular. Most people probably have worked with him at one time or another. <laughs> so I think we are going to enjoy this session very much. I hope everyone's had a great case conference. And I think this is a wonderful way for us all to come together on this last day. So uh, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end. Thanks, Liz. Melissa. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dan and I were chatting um, a little bit about just the frame. And, and I called him, I don't know, six months ago. And uh, some of you know Dan retired right before Labor Day. And uh, so it was, it was less than six months ago because I said, hey, how about at District 8 we, we do a little conversation? You know, as you transition into retirement, there's a couple of things you've picked up over 40 years advancement. And he said, Mike, when? And I said, District 8. Mike, that's in February. Yeah, it's always in February, Dan. Mike, I've got this retirement coach and she's doing an awesome job. <laughs> You're inside the six month window. And I paused. I used to be in sales. And I thought, if I wait. And he says, OK. <laughs> so I Dan. Didn't, I, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> I can tell you this, I, though. He was in Hawaii two days ago, and he's here today. Yeah, yeah. I was in Kauai. Yeah. Uh, what I said to Mike was, and Mike said to me, WSU, I think, is the host right. institution for the conference. Chair, yeah, yeah. And, and I said, Mike, if it helps WSU <laughs> and it helps you, I'll, I'll come do this yeah. uh, for Case. Yeah. Well, I think... Um, Thank you, Dan, on behalf of WSU, as well as all of Case District 8. So uh, what we thought we'd do, uh, you know, we, did, we spent a little time preparing for this morning. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's a chance for each of you to hear a little bit about Dan and his journey and some lessons he's picked up along the way. Um, so it, I think contextually, some of you know Dan. Some of you I've had a chance to meet as well. Uh, we met in 1982, and then uh, Dan came to work WSU on a well, somewhere in there, and then on a permanent basis, I think in 86, on a full-time full job, but had worked in advancement even before that. So Dan, if we, if we were to look at this in a linear fashion, I thought maybe we could talk about different elements um, of wisdom you've picked up along the way. So if you wouldn't mind, kind of go back to the beginning and, and share maybe something from each of the, the stops or each of the jobs. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um uh, so it starts for me at WSU, and it started uh, through an internship. So I think probably for many of us, um, you know, we've, we, we, didn't go, we didn't think about a career in advancement. Mike mentioned he was in sales, right? He was selling, uh, he was sell when, I, when, I, when I was in the process of hiring Mike, he was selling uh, cellular phones, those giant <laughs> things that, right? That's what Mike was doing. 3,000 bucks for the phone. Yeah, good commission. <laughs> um, so, uh, so for me, it started as an internship. And, um, and the, I wrote down a couple things about the WSU experience. Mike tipped me off that he was probably going to start with this question. Um, first of all, I was exposed to the concept of integrated advancement from day one. It's all I knew. The person, uh, the person that uh, gave me the internship, a, a guy who's been a lifelong mentor to me, a uh, person named Stan Schmid. Um, he's now an artist in Palm Desert, so you can Google him, Stanton Schmid. Um, you'll find him. Uh, but he was a fierce proponent of institutional or of, of institutional advancement done in an integrated fashion. Um, and so that's what, that's what I learned on day one. And, and it's a philosophy of his that I've subscribed to for my entire professional career. And we can talk more about that. Um, so that notion of integrated advancement being the right way to do advancement, I would say hallmark of WSU. Um, the, the notion that 
uh, representing something that you believe in, a mission that you believe in. I was, an, I was, a, um, I was a graduate of WSU. I'm a proud Coug. Um, I was a student body vice president. I knew the institution um, deeply, thoroughly, but it was the mission of the institution that really resonated with me. Um, my son is here in the room today. Um, you know, I, I'm blessed to have three wonderful kids. Um, two of the three are products of public higher education. That's the mission that speaks to me, public higher education, access, uh, uh, the land grant tradition. So those were things that I took out of WSU. Um, I could drill into, I mean, I had about four different careers in 20 years at WSU. Um, that's the benefit of being at a large public. Um, but uh, I think as I migrated to uh, the University of Washington for the first time to become part of the medicine team, a fabulous team, um, after two years there, I recognized that medicine wasn't for me. So the learning for, for that was, I can't go represent anything, right? I need to represent something that aligns with my personal values, my personal sort of mission statement, if you will. And again, that's public higher education because it gives us a chance to educate at mass um, uh, alumni who go out in the world into a democratic, small d, democratic world and hopefully become the next generation of leaders, builders, innovators, um, community activists. They, they, they work to build a better world and that's, 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 sort of my, that's sort of my mission, right? So when I had the chance to go to Oregon State, um, I went back to a land grant. I went back to a place that, that um, I knew the mission, I didn't know the school, but I knew what the core mission was and it spoke to me in, in that sense. Um, fabulous team there. Uh, I see Michael Reza here who was part of that team at Oregon State from the days. There, Grady Goodall I see here. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a few familiar faces. Um, what I took out of Oregon State was their, the alignment of the strategic plan of the university and the foundation's purpose and priorities and focus on fundraising. So it was that the, what we were asking donors to do at Oregon State was less about supporting their passion and more about supporting the institution and the institution's priorities. And fundamentally, I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, you can get me going for hours on the, the problems in our profession around donor-centric fundraising. Um, but I think Oregon State did it with the, the right balance, that introducing priorities and inviting donors to align with those priorities where the, where the values intersected. Oregon State also, from a fundraising perspective, had a maniacal focus on fundraiser accountability, a maniacal focus on fundraiser accountability, and forever grateful for that learning because it's something I, I carried with me. At Illinois, um, where I went as the Vice Chancellor for Advancement to lead the development enterprise um, at Illinois, um, it was all about developing and earning and building trust and confidence with the institutions, academic leaders, and, and building alignment around, again, that a strategic plan, sort of a vision for how we were going to close a gap. Illinois at that time was raising half of what its Big Ten or aspirational public peers were raising. And so the, the challenge there was to close that gap. And um, so, so building that alignment around that was sort of the key takeaway. Um, and then I think when I came back to the University of Washington to finish my career, to come home, to be close to kids, to be close to my parents down in Federal Way. Hey, today's my mom's 91st birthday. Mike knows Grandma P, so little little shout out there. Um, the, uh, um, you know, what I realized at the University of Washington, two things. Um, one, uh, brand matters. 
So back to that concept of integrated advancement, um, I have a recipe that I call the four predictors of, of success. The, the first one is, is all around having a compelling case for support, your brand, that is uh, well communicated, well articulated, aligns with the strategic plan, aligns with the vision of the institution. Um, but I really saw that at the University of Washington. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Mary Gresh and her team on the marketing side for building a very powerful brand at the University of Washington in full partnership with all the academics, right? But 75% um, of the 150,000 plus donors to the University of Washington during my tenure there are non-alumni, 75%. Okay. Now, alumni, great, matters, all of that. But if you don't have a brand, you're not going to reach, I mean, you're not, you're, you're not going to move away from Hale alma mater alumni loyalty to, to be able to sort of drive change in the world without that kind of positive brand. So I learned that brand mattered at the University of Washington, and I was really grateful to that. Sadly, I think the, 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 the piece that I took away from my time at the University of Washington, largely as a result of the um, death, the murder of George Floyd, the, uh, the um, trauma of that era, is um, that our business, my business, the world of philanthropy, um, is wrought with systemic racism. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And my hope for you that are young, my hope for you that are the next leaders of the profession, I came to that realization um, way too late. Uh, um, I, I was in Illinois when the, the young man outside of St. Louis was similarly murdered, um, and it had no effect. It just went right over the top. It's not something I'm proud of. Um, it's like I, we got up the next day and we went back to work and, and nothing had changed. The world changed after George Floyd's murder, rightfully. It needed to change. Um, I just wish I would have, I'm grateful that it hit me like a ton of bricks then. I just wish it would have, I just wish it would have been 15 years earlier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm going to ask for a little help from the audience. Kaylee said, Mike, you need to get mic'd up and grab the clicker. I got that half right, so if we're playing baseball, I'd be in the Hall of Fame, but I need the <laughs> clicker. Um, so if Melissa can help with that, we do have some slides, and I want to make sure, I mean, a lot of people put some effort into the slides without the clicker, we won't Kaylee see Kaylee included, <laughs> thank you, Kaylee. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and, and as we work through the slides, I, I think, Dan, there's a couple of messages and, and images that we'll convey on this journey. Um, it wasn't that far away, thanks. Are you the we, conference chair? Same thing I did. So you're the conference chair. Yeah. So, okay. We could have done that. <laughs> Probably could have. So let me, and uh, the people that work with me know that I, even when I have the clicker in my hand, I don't necessarily use it all that well. So we're going to give this a shot at the end. All right. So there we are. And we've got QR codes to the LinkedIn. Uh, if you're trying to connect with Dan or I, that's the easiest way to do it. So I'm going to skip past that one. We've got the QR codes in a final slide as well. So um, Dan, talk about this slide a little bit, Dan. Uh, well, yeah, it's the it's the favorite picture that I had in my office at the University of Washington. Um, it's the one, it's the one, UW brand, brand element yeah, that sure. I packed into the retirement box and took yeah. home with me, yeah. because I, it this this sums it up. This is yeah. this is the essence of leadership. <clears throat> Um, the advancement team at the UW was a big fan of the uh, book Boys in the Boat. Yeah. Uh, it's a great book, great read. It's about the uh, U.S. Uh, Olympic, men's Olympic rowing team that won during Nazi Germany, the Olympics in Berlin. I think it was 1936. 36. Yep. And Who's read the book? I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, Boys in the Boat. Great book. This Fantastic. picture, this visual yeah. reminded me of that, yeah. you know. And, and I can sit up here and talk about life lessons and all of that. But so much of it is what you learn from your parents, what you learn from your children, what you learn from colleagues, what you learn together. And that's what this slide reminded me of, Mike. It's just, we is greater than me. So I'll pontificate, I'll share, I'll talk to people after this. Um, 
but this is a community and yeah. anything that I'm giving to you is because others have given to me and I'm yeah. just grateful to be in that position and, yeah. and the ability to give back. Yeah, and as we were building the presentation and Dan was working through the slides, he said, you know what, I wanna keep the slides the way they were. You know, we, we did a presentation in Calgary a number of years ago. We had some slides, Dan was in Illinois at the time. So you'll see slides branded, but the representative of when Dan picked up that nugget or those elements of leadership in the journey. So it's not that Kaylee didn't update the slides. Kaylee yeah. did a great job with the slides. We intentionally, they look a little bit older because they're representative of the journey. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go, Illinois. Yeah. Well, this is about integrated advancement and there's yeah. two slides here that represent this and we're not going to cover all the slides, but I think they're going to be available on the conference right. portal. So again, a bit of a gift from me to you if they help and connect with me on LinkedIn if something yeah. doesn't make sense and you want to talk more about it, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, but I, I put these up, one for Illinois, one for the University of Washington, just so you see, Mike, if you want to go to the yeah. next one, just so you see that that this concept of integrated advancement was something that you know I was representing, I was advocating for at Illinois. Um, and uh, on the Illinois slide, uh, there's a little uh, tagline at the bottom, advancement is everyone's business. Where did that come from, folks? Connie Kravis. <laughs> Not okay. at Illinois. Not at Illinois, <laughs> but thank you, Connie Kravis, for that ability to, um, you know, take that little bit of wisdom and share it. And I used this slide came from a training that I did with vice chancellors, with deans. I also used this with at new faculty orientation. So this was my chance to sort of talk about what's the mission, and then um, what are respective roles. Uh, and, and that drill in the, the, the concept that, you know, advancement isn't my work, advancement is our work. Dan, when we were in Illinois, well, when we were in Calgary and you were talking about Illinois, you had spent a fair amount of time on the mission, vision, and values in the mission statement. Yep. So you've got the Illinois mission statement, you've got UW mission, vision, and values. Can you weigh in a little bit more as to the, the, the process to develop these elements? Well, I think the, at least for me, that process has to be something that is co-created with the team. Um, the, once we reach a place where we have a vision statement, mission, values, um, again, my philosophy is I'm gonna recruit to that. I'm gonna look for people, for talent to join that. I'm gonna hold that out as um, uh, sort of sacrosanct, if you will. Um, it's not that I want to have people fit. I want people, I, I want to recruit talent that is diverse, that's going to help us sort of push the edges. But there's a core philosophy that's probably going to stay pretty true. Um, so to do that effectively, at least in my view, it's got to be something that is co-created. And so, you know, the way we did it at, um, Illinois, the way that we did the values work at uh, the University of Washington was to do it through a task force that represented the entire uh, integrated advancement community that came together, that worked for six to 12 months on it, depending on the institution, and then ultimately brought something back um, that in the UW's case, UW's uh, integrated advancement team is about 620 people. Um, we did town halls that involved 450 of those people actively participating. So co-created. Not you in your office Thursday afternoon scribbling some notes. No, <laughs> but often um, leaders lead. Right. So often Sometimes you'll need to come with maybe a rough 1.0. Yeah. You may need to come with some four corners that you want the group to consider. Um, uh, the, the last sort of task force I put in place at the University of Washington uh, that I think is still going on is the, um, it was called DAWG, D-A-W-G, so the Development Advisory Work Group 
to sort of think about in the post-campaign, inter-campaign period at the University of Washington, to think about some of the ways that development might need to, to um, uh, amend its work, uh, particularly given a need to be less donor-centric, particularly recognizing some of the issues around systemic racism that I mentioned um, earlier. So, uh, um, you know, I gave that group a little bit of a charge, but I also, by design, some pretty yeah. broad latitude. Yeah, you referenced the, the four, um, well, your philosophy for success and the four elements of that, so I've, I've transitioned to okay. that slide. Uh, talk about what these are, where they came from, where they take you. Yeah, I mean, these are really, I, I, this has a WSU logo on it because I sort of had crystallized this um, as I was kind of winding up at, at WSU and I was sort of yeah. thinking about broader roles. Um, and it, it's, this isn't original. I, I, I've thought about this. It's, it's picking up nuggets from conferences like this. It's a lot of reading. I'm a, I'm a son of a librarian. My mother's an elementary school librarian, so I read a ton. I've always read, and from day one in this profession, I would read Case Currents, um, hard copy, uh, <laughs> Case Currents, um, you know, cover to cover. And I was one of those people when somebody said, we've got 50 examples of this, I was one of those people that would write, write pre-email, would write to those schools and ask, you know, can I get one of your 50 packets? Um, so, you know, a lot of reading, a lot of networking, conferences, a lot of learning that way. But there's a, a, a group of leading consultants that I want to sort of give a shout out to because they've really informed this four corners or this uh, four predictors, if you will. GGNA, Ben Swaley Flessner, Martin Lundy, more recently Campbell and Company and Ostara, two groups I worked with at the University of Washington. Um, the folks at RNL, um, particularly RNL, thinking ahead about some of the, yeah. the changing donor demographics. I, I think some of their work has been really great there. Plus Delta, um, I, I've become a, f a huge advocate of Plus Delta and their approach to um, sort of building on the, the Oregon State days of maniacal focus, their approach, the Plus Delta approach. Um, and I'm also, while I never bought their product philosophically I'm a huge believer in what Evertrue is yeah. is the way Evertrue is is looking at our work so yeah. all of that um, is how I developed sort of the the four the four predictors, predictors. if you will yeah. and I pull it out and I look at it I'm an attorney by training so I ask myself er, periodically is this still good law right? Does this still hold? Um, and I think it does. Uh, and so the way I've used it, Mike, is to, to analyze the situation. So this is the fundamental way I would analyze. It's how I analyze the situation going into Illinois. It's how I analyze the situation coming back to Washington. Um, if, if somebody called me to do a consulting gig, it's how I would, would start that process. And through this analysis, I would develop then what I, if you thought of the Cougar Head logo here as maybe a North Star, I would develop a North Star that would represent the broad outline of a plan. And I would, so the analysis would take us from a present position to a North Star. And then I would use that to sort of build out the plan and, and then go to work. Well, and, and North Star, Steve Hoffman, adding one more yeah, to Stephen your Hoffman, list of yeah. really valuable consultants in, in building out this journey. And I, I continue to think of this as we do early campaign planning. So much of this, I, you know, these right are there. the fundamentals as to, and some of you were at Aaron Escobar's uh, presentation the other day on a, a facility campaign. And a lot, the different words, really similar messages as to what we heard from Aaron in terms of how they built out their plan for success. Yeah, yeah Aaron and I talked about this a lot when yeah. I was at, at um, you know, when I was, when I was at uh, uh, Oregon State. Yeah. I, I had the, f I had on my door, when I was part of the UW Medicine team and we were in a campaign and we had, we had, we had it, they had a billion dollar goal, a six year campaign. I arrived with two years left 
and they were $400 million away from the goal. The math doesn't work. The math doesn't <laughs> work, okay? And that was the framework for how we were going to tackle it, and I had it on the back of my door, and you know, when we would have our team meetings, the major gift officers, we'd, we'd often close the door, look at that, <laughs> say, you know, what, are, what is it that we're doing right? What do we, what do we gotta tweak here? Yeah. So it's just, it's something I've used um, from kind of the late WSU days, yeah. so that would be 2004, uh, 2005 yeah. yep. to, to today. Yeah, it's well, not fair to say this is the most important slide, but if you only if you only printed one, you might print this one. Yeah, yeah. this might be it's pretty high. It's it's, yeah. it's right there. Yeah. A few thoughts on internal leadership. Well, I again, the 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 notion that um, the notion here, first of all, and Mike, you and I used this yeah. one when we were in Calgary together. The idea that um, leaders are readers, yeah. right? Um, uh, uh, Danny, if you can tell Grandma that I that you know I was promoting the reading thing when when we see her for her birthday tomorrow. Um, but I, the the idea that that we have to be constantly growing as leaders, and we have to be constantly sort of looking at new material. And and again, this was done I think in 2016. So if I were to upgrade this slide today, uh, based on my own DEI yeah. journey, there would be a lot of stuff. Yep. over the last uh, three years that has a DEI flavor to it, yeah. uh, importantly. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just believe strongly that that's uh, something that, that we need to do. Uh, even this week when I was in um, Hawaii, I happened to see on LinkedIn a posting that one of UW's great uh, alumni donors, Neil Dempsey, put up. Uh, it was a Wall Street Journal article that talked about it was about talent. It was about recruiting and, and maintaining and nurturing talent. And there were, there, were some, there were some really good nuggets in that Wall Street Journal article. Um, find Neil Dempsey on LinkedIn if you're interested and you'll see it there. Uh, but, but you know, that's, yeah. you know, uh, you, I, think, I think we've gotta be there doing that. And I think as we, you know, it, we do deal with leadership transitions. And so whether you take a new job and, and meet your new boss, whether you end up with a new boss, one of those ways to connect with them. Hey, what book on leadership have yeah. you found the most valuable in your journey? Now you've got a chance to get in sync with your boss or your new boss. You know, when we did the presentation in Calgary, we spent a lot of time on the leadership challenge specifically. And the, the thing that continued- the, the book, the yes, leadership sorry, challenge. Yeah. Uh, what stuck with me is the, 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 the critical importance of credibility in leaders. That that is the element that I think is the single most important in terms of getting folks to be on your team. Credibility in leaders. The yeah. ability to be trustworthy. Right. Um, yeah. I, in fact, I would upgrade Mike's statement Fair. about the, the, um, the, pro, the, the concept of asking your boss mm -hmm. I would ask them in the interview process. Nice. When they turn the table to you and say, what are the questions you have for us? Good. I would ask the question there. Yeah. Because I think you want to figure out pretty quickly, you know, does the mission work? You know, Jerry Panis's book, Mega Gifts, yep. how, way back in the day, what did million dollar donors, uh, you know, what were the top things? Belief in mission, belief in leadership. Yep. I'd say the same thing about looking at jobs. Yeah. Believe, believe in the mission, know you can represent it, but make sure you're aligned with the leadership, yeah. right? So, and that alignment, I, Dan, yeah, down at the bottom left here, we've got the disc, uh, and, and that's one of the ways, yeah. uh, again, where we get to know ourselves and each other, but the idea that you spend time understanding the people you work with. Yeah. yeah. You ask questions based on that disc profile, you're gonna get a pretty good sense of how those people tick and, and if you know yourself, yeah. you're gonna know that, um, you, you're gonna know that uh, if it's a good fit or not a good fit, um, so. And you can even, you know, depending again, which one of these modalities you use, start to understand how your donors tick. Yeah. Oh, she's an engineer. She's gonna probably think like an engineer. I need to present information in a manner consistent with how she likes to receive that information. So there's, there's the, the the internal leadership piece, but that's one you can also transfer to the external. 
Kind of like we had to do with Gary Manchester <laughs> that day. I told Gary the Gary story last week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he, okay. Gary literally, oh, new topic. I'll get out a new legal pad. <laughs> Transitioned legal pads because we changed topics. Uh, great guy, great gift. We, we managed to work really well together. Huh. Yeah. All right, the trust equation. Dan. You know, this is not one I've used, so this is, this is one that I saw recently as a you know, new learning, but I thought I would just put it in here because it speaks to credibility, the, yeah. the, the formula, if you will. But the most important takeaway for me here was the S, and the S talks about, their per, about perspective. And I would submit you want to look for a leader, you want to be part of a team, um, and I as a leader would want to bring this, that has a balanced perspective on self. That I, I care as much about you as I want you to care about me and the organization, right? And so I think, I, you know, I have to be equally invested in my team as team members. And I think this, this equation, if you will, um, I thought was a nice visual kind of reminder of some of these key things. It's, it's about trust, it's built on credibility, but the S in this equation, I just, and, and making sure that you know how that is centered, whether the, whether, um, look, I, I don't do well with, with leaders who command loyalty, who demand loyalty. Nah, you don't demand loyalty. You, you earn that, yeah. you know, you earn that respect. Now, as a new leader walking into an organization, you would never have to, I would never say to you, you have to earn my respect. Well, you had that conversation in Illinois. I when did. When you got there. Well, and I told the Illinois team, I said the greatest leadership lesson in my life, honestly, was at Hamlin Elementary School when Danny was at first grade, the first grade team, right? It was um, 15 kids and you're the coach. I think you don't get to pick the team. It's 15, you're the coach, your kid gets to be on your team, B bad for the kid, and then the next 15 go to, you know, uh, Jerry Karstetter, yeah. right? And, and Jerry gets his team. Well, hey, those 15 are looking at you like, how are we gonna play this game, you know? And you've gotta look at them and say, I trust you from day one. I trust you, you know, you're my kids, you're my team, I trust you. The trust is yours to keep or to lose, yeah. but on day one, everybody, I don't care about the politics, that's what I told the Illinois team, I don't care about the politics of the past, I don't care about, right? What I care about is closing a gap. What I cared about at Illinois was moving the needle on how we were doing relative to our leading institutional peers. That's what I cared about. And I wanted a team that was, that was committed to that sort of shared goal. Um, you know, forget the past. It's draw a line in the sand. Move forward. Give trust and move forward. You talked earlier about DEI. We've got a slightly different acronym here, but... Uh, the JETI principle? Yeah, just yeah. go ahead and weave your way into that. Well, th this again, you know, this again from the UW days yeah. became really central and I really liked this slide in the sense that it provided for me at least a visual reminder of the importance of the work and what the what the journey needs to be not to not in the sense of um, being fair but in the sense of really reaching a state of justice if you will um, and that just you know that just handing somebody a little bigger step ladder, that's not enough, right? So we've got to commit to doing the, the deep introspective work to examine our systems, our policies, our procedures, everything that we're doing. And, I, and I'm grateful to uh, a talent management professional we had at, at the University of Washington, it's now up at the Bothell campus, um, who he said, you know, we're not looking for culture fit, we're looking for culture add. Um, and I thought that's a, that's a great way to describe how we should be um, looking at attracting talent um, is 
what are they, how are they going to add uh, diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, diversity of viewpoint to our, to our teams, and um, as a result, make the entire team um, better. Good. I'm gonna keep us moving, yep. Dan. It's starting to feel like Thanksgiving where that plate may be a little more full than we got room for. Well, let's, let's pass on the Dean one. Okay. Uh, the only thing I'd yeah. say there is a thank you to Greg Sheridan. Yeah. Back is in terms of the we is greater than me. This yeah. is Greg's slide, yeah. one I pulled. I just give it to you. This works. I know I'm talking to maybe some people that are in private schools with headmasters. This is, this, this is a Dean slide we used, but it works for athletic directors. It works, the thing I would say here, two things, make sure they understand their role and in the same process have the slide that is, describes your role and own your subject matter expertise. Respect theirs and own yours. Um, one of the really great things about working with Mike Goodwin at Oregon State, Mike is a master at, um, at owning and commanding subject matter expertise for the foundation, for, for his role as the, as the head of uh, um, the, the development enterprise. There. And that came through loud and clear in Aaron's uh, presentation the other, yeah, the other day as well. Just the idea of reinforcing, hey, if you're the dean of pharmacy or you're the, the VP of research, I appreciate and respect where your subject, subject matter expertise is. This is mine. Yeah. This is my team's. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to have a great partnership yeah. if we respect those. Yeah. Right? Good. Um, so. A few thoughts about building champions, and then we can, yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about the progressive relationship slide. I, just, or, I put or, a yeah. couple of slides in here for you. The importance of, you know, look, fundraising is about raising dollars. Again, my four predictors, we don't raise dollars unless we have relationships to go out and, and yeah. solicit, okay? Yeah. So for any of you, anybody here that's in the, anybody in the room in the marketing side or in the alumni engagement side, okay? Yeah. Okay, I, I salute the work that you do. It's fundamental, it's important. We're not gonna raise money without it. And so I put a couple of things in here about um, the importance of this work. And again, this is really more my gift to you uh, this is a slide we used at the University of Washington um, to describe this sort of process. There's a slide, Mike, if we move forward, that again is my respect for Evertrue, kind of the way that they think about doing it, which I think makes a lot of sense from a visual. These are, these are tools you can use in explaining our work, particularly to boards, to volunteers, to academics. Um, and then the third piece here is, um, I think I put it in here. Is that one? Yep. Okay. Um, the third one is uh, with a shout out to um, my uh, longtime assistant, Emelina Berkshire. Um, Emelina put this slide together for me, and I, this one I got to take my glasses and take a peek at, because um, <laughs> what it says is, um, so the premise of this is we can I believe we can do more effective engagement work at scale, at scale, because, and, and do this work with more technology-based platforms and tools because we need technology and platforms and tools to scale, but more importantly, because our constituency is demanding it. Right. And our constituency going forward, I look at the age of this <laughs> audience and you reflect it, the constituency going forward is even gonna demand it more. So we have to meet that demand. And, and Emelina helped me understand this when she said, we need to invest now in information management. That's all the way upstream, information management. We don't need to invest Initially, sorry, alumni engagement people, <laughs> marketing professionals, okay? Your work is important, but if we don't invest upstream, you're not gonna have the tools to do your work effectively. And that's what I really loved about this slide because it helped me understand as a person who doesn't get technology very well, okay? <laughs> Kaylee looked at the slides and went, <laughs> oh my God, these are rough. Um, so. You know, as a person who doesn't get technology well, 
Emelina's gift to me was this visual of how to see how these pieces go together. Invest now in information management as, a, as foundational infrastructure to enable more robust analytics, which inform digital, uh, strategic digital engagement initiatives that lead to profound engagement that will help drive fundraising. Okay, now there's a lot of, this is a UW specific thing, so there's references to how that would work at UW, but if you look at that top line, um, again. Uh, uh, that translates. Yeah. <laughs> Period, yeah, good. All right, we're gonna transition to the engine. So this is, this was my most important takeaway at Illinois, um, was the notion that um, the, Success starts with the team. It starts with uh, how the team, who the team is, how the team is built. Um, you know, it's everything. And Mike, actually, if you could go to the next uh, slide, the one that with the, okay, yeah. Because I, I, I thought about this, so I wanted to flip the order. Sure. So this was my plan at Illinois. So this was my North Star, five points. Okay, I, I put this slide in here because I wanted you to see point five, far right, team. All about the team, okay? So now if we go back to the, to the, uh, the other slide, the WSU one, lessons in leadership, what you can do, what each of you can do as a leader in your respective roles, bring your A game every day, right? And, and understand the, the sort of the, um, the, things that were, the things that I was looking for as a leader in terms of the A-game elements, okay? And so you can see the pictures here. So the guy on the far <laughs> right, the artist, that's Stan. So Stan used to say, bright, hardworking, and caring. That's what we want to hire. We want to hire people who are bright, hardworking, and caring, you know? And if I would have held on to that more firmly from day one, then I would have been more intentional about hiring people who didn't look like me or present like me. I would have hired for culture ad versus culture fit, right? So it was there 35, 40 years ago, it was there, and there were elements of it that I held on to it, but I didn't really fully grasp it. Um, I added the I piece to yeah. it, okay? The integrity piece, okay, I think is really critical. So that's my part of the equation. So I, I thought it was sort of Stan's thing. Right. And then Connie would always talk about it at the University of Washington and people would say, no, that was Connie's thing, bright, hardworking and caring. <laughs> and then when I got to the University of Washington, I actually learned that no, bright, hardworking and caring came from UW president, Charles Odegaard. That was his mantra, Odegaard Library at the UW, right on the quad, okay? That was his mantra, and guess what? Stan had been his sort of chief of staff, right-hand protege early in his career. So I guess in, you know, it's hard for the Coug to say this, but in, you know, maybe all roads lead back to the UW and Red Square and, and the, the Gerberding Administration Building, I don't know. It's still tied to Stan for me. So. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I think, Mike, we could probably, I mean, we had, we had a couple of others here. Oh, the, yeah. let me, let's jump. You can, because again, you're going to see these. Yeah. Here, let me, let's finish with the impactful gifts. Well, I, I, I want to just highlight one thing. And yeah. There's people that, that have... You know, there's things that come out of my mouth that actually I, they went into my ear from Dan. Build your plan, work your plan. You know, so if you've heard me say that, I don't know where you got it, but Greg Sheridan. Yeah, it's on this slide. We is greater than me. Yeah. Build a plan, work the plan. It helps us so much in our work when we can look at the person that says, oh, we should start doing this. Now, we wrote our plan. I will look at that for next year's plan. We are working our plan. Yeah. Build your plan, work your plan. So yep. where do you want me to uh, Let's go. To? So all of this for yeah. me was, and, and I wanted to leave you with this sort of, I talked about, I kind of harped a little bit about yeah. donor-centric, okay? 
So I want to leave you with a slide that is um, a Venn diagram that talks about gifts of impact. And I, as a development, for those of you in the room that are development professionals, um, this is where I hope our, our profession will go. Um, we talked about it at the University of Washington as gifts of impact. And, you know, boy, the minute I started talking about less donor centric and gifts of impact or values aligned fundraising, I had people on the team, sorry if there are UW people here, they're all listening to their new boss talk. They, you know, they, they had to go do Is that. Tamara here? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, which I understand, that's good. Um, but uh, there was this fear that, oh my God, we can't be donor centric. That means we've got to raise, we, you know, the only good gift is an unrestricted gift. I'm not saying that every gift has to be unrestricted, okay? Now, I'm gonna give a shout out to Mackenzie Scott and the form of philanthropy that she's doing. That, we need a lot more of that. I don't know if you, you saw the $100 million bequest in San Diego to the San Diego Community Foundation from a person they didn't know but a person who undoubtedly believed in San Diego, believed in supporting the important work that, that uh, different nonprofits do, and entrusted that community foundation. I mean, yeah, we should all be happy for unrestricted gifts, but values-aligned fundraising doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean that we only are looking for unrestricted gifts. It does mean we should lead with our institution's priorities. We should align those priorities around things that donors are interested in. And we should structure the gift in a way, this is the third and bottom circle, that makes the gift as easy to use as possible. And particularly gifts of endowment that will stand the test of time, okay? I, I am, I am individually recentering my giving at WSU to focus on a unrestricted gift to the College of Liberal Arts that the dean can use at their discretion um, because I don't want to prescribe. I want the college to be as strong as possible. And who am I to prescribe how best to do that? Who am I to bring a 65-year-old white male perspective informed by experiences between 1978 and 1982, who am I to bring that into 2023, let alone 2053 or, or 2100, right? Shame on me if, if that's the approach I take. And that's, I'd leave it yeah. at that, Mike. Well, and as we deal with, the, the, if you will, the next gen of donors, we think back our parents' era was more of the, uh, I trust the leadership, I believe in the mission. Now the next gen is saying, show me exactly what you've done with my money, which does not fall out of alignment with what you just said. No. It, it adds an appropriate or reinforces that obligation we have to steward because effectively sharing with individuals, the impact of their support is stewardship. And so it's continue to do what you should have been doing already, do that well, you'll continue to be worthy of their support. Right, but I would submit, I would submit if there are 50 institutions represented in the room today, I would submit that all 50 of us have far more unspent gift balances oh, um, yeah. than we want to admit. Let's not look at those ledgers today. Right. Let's keep the conversation moving. Right, yeah. and, and that is a headline liability, folks. Oh yeah. That is a headline liability. Um, if you're not spending the gift funds, um, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass at some point. And it will, I mean, it will dry up future fundraising. So, there. All right, so that was, uh, that was a powerful final slide. That's the last one we had in the deck. We've got to the LinkedIn uh, points of contact again. We've got about 10, 12 minutes for questions. Uh, so we, we roughly hit our target there. So we're back to batting over 500. Um, Questions out there, and I don't know if we have runners with microphones, but if not, you can scream to us and we'll repeat them and then we'll take it. Dan is pointing, oh, are you waving or, or, or you saw a question, Dan? I, I, I saw Claire on, on, <laughs> on uh, we texted back and forth and I said, Claire, you better make sure you ask a hard question. Uh oh, Claire, now the pressure's on. <laughs> I said and, that to Liz Ryan too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> don't worry, I warned my team. If you're in the room, Dan's, Dan wants a hard question. So Claire, are you prepared to ask yours?
biggest leadership challenge is what I heard. Claire, did I get the question right? Okay. You know, Claire, I think it's probably, um, it's probably some of the time we spent together at, at uh, the UW. Um, the, the, I think the UW, I think the UW struggled with the concept of integrated advancement and struggled with the balance, uh, the allocation of resources across an integrated advancement program. And I don't say this maliciously, I don't say this with judgment, but the, the size of the organization, the size of that institution to get sort of everybody aligned and kind of and, and seeing it the same way, big challenge, you know. Um, and I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge, uh, big challenge. Um, so I, I would say that's one of them. And um, for me personally, the having to recenter myself in uh, around these principles of Jedi, yeah. um, and uh, um, and it wasn't just in an ethnically diverse way I had to reshape my thinking. I am grateful to you and Tracy for um, basically saying, uh, Dan, stop the mansplaining, right? <laughs> right? I, I, I had to, I had to, to refine and um, reshape, um, I had to reshape, you know, the way I um, offered myself to the team. Yeah. So, um, and that's, you know, when you're, when you're 60 years old and you think you've got it sort of figured out, that's, <laughs> that's hard to hear, but, but I had to hear it, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, great question, Claire. And I wanna hijack a little bit. One of the things we talked about, Dan, when, when Dan hired me, there was not a computer on my desk. There was no email, that at least it didn't function. I mean, you remember trying to get on profs? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, contact reports were done on carbon paper. I told that to someone the other day. They're like, what's carbon paper? Oh, that's that thing where the guy, the, the person that comes to your house and then they give you a receipt and you get the top and they get the, yeah. Okay, that was contact reports. So we've come a long way, 40 years, uh, 34 for me. What, what do you see looking forward? Where are we going? If that's where we were and somebody's in here that's 25 and it's their first week or year on the job and you say, okay, 34 years forward, which part of that can you see already? Um, I thought you might ask that, because <laughs> uh, I would have. Um, so I actually wrote some things down. Okay, so n that won't surprise people n uh, that know me. Number one, um, I am really worried about the public perception of education. I'm not just saying now higher, higher education, higher. but the public, and I think the privates in the room you, this even maybe this may, both the private higher ed and private secondary. This may be as relevant, um, but the public perception of education and the impact of declining perceptions, because right. I think the yes. perceptions are declining on fundraising, on advancement. Yeah. Um, in fact, Jim Langley, I saw on LinkedIn. I think it was yesterday, or maybe no, it was yesterday. But he had a nice piece on there about polarization, the polarization of our society and how that may impact our work. Um, that's, sure. to me, that's, that's a big one. And it's the political influence, but Mike, it's also what you just mentioned. It's the generational differences yeah. and particularly younger generations who are less trusting of any kind of institution, yeah. right? Yeah. Less trusting of any kind of institution. And so good on them, which means, you know, we got to step up and bring our A game to show that impact if we're going to expect to engender that kind of trust and confidence and, and support from, from those generations. So that, that was number one for me. I think as a profession, we should redefine what fundraising success means. Um, I, I grew up where it was all around the dollar totals, you know, yeah. and we were proud of the fact that the 80-20 business rule applied and that that rule had, had morphed to become 99-1, 1 percent of the donors providing 99 percent of the support. I don't think that's good law anymore. I don't think it should be good law. 
Okay, I guess I let yeah. me phrase it that way. So that was one of the things I asked the, the development advisory work group to think about at the U UW. I mean, what's the definition of fundraising success? How does that look different going forward? How does that how is that done in a more inclusive, more Jedi focused way? Um, because I think there are ways that we can do that. Um, dollars are always going to be sure. important, but I think that there's ways that we can build around that. So I would say that's number two, Mike. And then number three is talent. Um, I'm, really, I'm really grateful to Gensi Franz, the talent management um, guru I hired at Illinois, um, because he looked at me and he said, Dan, young talent, most of you in the room, <laughs> are going to be consumers of jobs. Okay, institutional loyalty, consumers of jobs until they find the organization whose values align with theirs. And if you can, if you can find that alignment, help them see purpose, help them see a path to have more purpose, more impact, that's when you will generate loyalty retention, employee uh, uh, talent engagement. Um, and I think that's so spot on. And I, it, that to me was just sort of been amplified by COVID, yeah. by everything that we've been going through, the yeah. tightness of the labor market yeah. generally, right? Yeah. Um, Dan ran a search that he said, you know, the, 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 it's just tough. I think Claire, you mentioned tough to get candidate pools here recently. So. Yeah. Talent. I think yeah. we just got to stay yeah. laser focused on talent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. We try to restate that. Yeah, please. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. What I think I heard was what's Advancement's role in trying to diminish this polarization and create a more welcoming environment of both the, in terms of the employment level, but the curriculum level as well. Was that close? Yeah. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, again, I think, the, I think it goes back to the, uh, I would approach it based on my four predictors. I would say it's all around, it's all around um, number one and number three. Okay, so it's taking the, it's, it's, it's maniacal focus on um, the value of education in terms of building a democratic society. And a democratic society should not be polarized, but it should encourage robust discussion of important topics around the future of our, uh, of our world, of our, yeah. of our society. Yeah. And, we should say proudly that we as, as educational institutions value that breadth of discourse. We, we, you know, we, should not, we should not try to adopt a mindset where we're encouraging one aspect of that polarization, right? So we should be comfortable saying, come one, come all to our institution and you're going to get wide exposure. You're going to be taught to critically think to analyze, right? So it's those sort of core fundamental values of a liberal arts-based education that we should, doesn't, I'm not taking anything away from engineering no. and anything away from tech, right? Those are all premised on, on those same values. I, I was in, when I was in Illinois, I, was, I, I met with a billionaire there who had put 20 some million dollars of his own money, one of our alums, into educational exchanges between Japan and China. And I asked him the question, because Illinois was big on international Chinese uh, students coming. And I asked him, you know, is that a good business model going forward? And his answer to me was um, no in the liberal arts side, yes in the engineering side, 
And I looked at him and I said, what? And he said, we're going to build out our own capacity in China to educate Chinese students the way we want them to be educated, not the way, not the way public higher education, particularly public higher education, right? But he said, we'll never be able to replicate the entrepreneurial spirit of the American educational system that encourages that freedom to dive and discourse. He said, that's, the, that's what makes engineers great. It's engineering was based on that sort of broad liberal arts. But I, it was just such a revelation that he shared because it was like, wow, that's the way the other side of the world sees our system, right. if you will. But I, for me, it would be number one, you know, stay on brand, and number two, build the champions, build those champions, engage champions that are spreading that brand message through their own network, through their own platforms, because that's going to have probably more impact than our own than our own marketing efforts, right? When they become our when they adopt our brand and put that back out into their own, the marketing experts tell me that that's the, that's the, that's the holy grail, right? Yeah. So that, that's the way I would approach it. Great. Thank you. Great question. One final question before we wrap it up. Anybody? Justin? Yeah. Oops, I'm sorry. We'll do two. I saw you in the back. Justin, I'll try to be quick. Yeah. Yeah, just really quickly, so first 90 days, when you, when you walk into a leadership transition, first 90 days. A lot written on this, Justin, and, and there's probably a lot of different ways. I'm, um, I'm a history undergraduate major, <laughs> okay? So my approach is to try to listen and learn, probably more so than to issue pronouncements. Um, uh, so I, first 90 days for me would be uh, a pretty, pretty deep listening, learning, diving in. Um, by six months, I'm going to probably want to have that first North draft Star. of the North Star and yeah. start to be socializing that in whatever form I think makes sense. Um, I'm going to have that 1.0 leader lead North Star, um, four predictors. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have worked through that probably by the first six months but not within the first 90 days. Yeah. This is part of my, um, you know, I, I, I can't pretend to come in and, and, and know Oregon State or know, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't pretend to come in and know plan giving at WSU when I took that <laughs> over in 1997, yeah. coming out of athletic fundraising. I mean, yeah. it was just a big radical shift yeah. that I had to do. So I needed 90 days at least to get, you know, to do some learning, yeah. so. good. Thanks, Justin. All right, in the back. Last one. Go ahead. I couldn't quite. I, I heard the I, bias because I, I think of your bookends, but uh, bringing, go ahead, just nice and loud. Yeah, philosophy on bringing people with you, depending on kind of what they bring. Is that close? Are you talking about bringing people physically with me to another institution or into another? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to, so yes. I think it goes back to the, um, you know, it goes back to the, the basketball coaching, you know, the, you know, build the bench, right? Uh, try to make sure that from a leadership standpoint, you're always looking at talent from the standpoint of who could move to what, um, who could be good. And then what I tried to do, uh, it was harder at the University of Washington because of the scale. Um, but what I try to do as a leader is always keep an open door and let people come in that, um, the, that, that I invited people to come in and have um, conversations about your future, right. about where do you want to go and what, what nuggets I would share. I don't think that I would say I was a formal mentor to a lot of people, but I think maybe an informal coach 
to a fair number of people would be probably a, a, a more accurate description. Um, well, I think that ties well with, and I apologize to your colleague at Illinois, the comment in terms of this next generation of team members finding that place and your open-mindedness to say, let's talk about where, you're, where you wanna go, how can I help you develop those skills? And they may be, there may be opportunities here, I hope there are, but part of your ethos, which I saw early on, is my role as the leader is to help you grow. I mean, when, when you helped Brady Crook transition down to Grants Pass, and I'm thinking, I thought you were in charge of advancement or development for athletics. We want to keep Brady. And you said, Brady's got more opportunity where they can put him than we can provide for him here. I'm going to help Brady grow. And so I think it's both internal and external. But, but what I learned from you there, Dan, is my, my role is to help you become the best you can be and where you want to go. And it's ideal if that's here, but if I don't have that opportunity for you or I believe in where you're going, then I will help you go there. Yeah. Is that fair? I think that's, it's, yeah, spot on. Um, uh, hope, I did it, hope I did it right <laughs> more times than I probably didn't help somebody. Yeah. But I think go, go back and look at that slide we had on the trust you know, the, the trust that equation, yep. that's the S. That's yeah. what we just talked about is the yeah. S, is that perspective that, you know, um, my, um, I, I mean, and, and we is greater than me, yeah. right? My, to the extent that I have had success, to the extent that I have contributed to our profession, it's because of the we. It isn't because of the me, it's what I learned from the we. So I feel, I feel a strong obligation. Uh, it's why I said yes to Mike inside of my six month, no fly zone, no work zone. Um, uh, it's, you know, because I, I, people like Stan and Connie and Greg and Mike Goodwin and Jim Livengood and, you know, folks like that, um, this guy, People, people helped me along the way, and it's, it's why I feel, you know, the sense of duty, responsibility, obligation to make sure that there's, I'm going to give you what I got. If it works for you, great. Yeah. Um, if it, if it um, didn't or you want to challenge something, um, again, I, 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 in the spirit of, of um, uh, a democratic society, I welcome, I welcome that discourse, too. Yes. All right. With that, we'll wrap it up. Dan, uh, A, it's great to see you. Um, B, Likewise. please give your mother a hug for me when you I see will. her tomorrow. Um, give on behalf of, thank you, I shall give your goddaughter a hug when I get home tonight. Uh, on behalf of everybody at Case District 8, we're grateful for everything you've done for the region, whether it be at Washington State, University of Washington, Oregon State, and, and the folks at Illinois certainly benefited as well. So thank you again for being here today, and thanks for all you've done for all of us. Thanks. All right. Good to see you, man. Nice to see you. Yeah. That's fun. Awesome. Yeah.